Okay, so uh, I'm going to be talking about some of the activities that we've been pursuing at a European level, trying to look at uh, land use at 6,000 uh, BP. Um, I'm going to, I've got some results to show you, but I'm also going to talk a bit about some of the issues that we've been having to deal with uh, and how you develop a methodology for doing something like this. So it's a fairly open uh, presentation. Um, so you are aware of the issues behind um, Land 6K project overall and it's really about trying to reconstruct the uh, land use component of the uh, Land 6K project. So I'm not going to go through all of these in too much detail. I'm going to focus down on Europe. So this is one of the models which has been created uh, by the modellers. Uh, this is the work of Peace. Uh, I forget his second name now. Uh, <laughs> um, this is one of the hide maps which have been created for Europe. Um, you can download these uh, and there are different time slices represented. I'm only going to show you one. This is for 4000 BC which is the time frame that we're interested in. Uh, and I think as you can probably see that the vast majority of Europe during this particular time frame is pretty well much dominated by uh, woodlands in particular. Um, and I think there, there has been a general sense amongst the archaeological community that this map doesn't have a huge amount of bearing on what we see archaeologically, but also up till now it's been quite difficult to synthesise uh, the knowledge that we do have. Um, this paper was published quite recently and what it's trying to do is to compare the different modelling approaches and how they've been reconstructing uh, land use. So it's comparing the Hyde and the KK10 models for the area of openness being represented at a European um, uh, continental scale. Um, so the Hyde and KK10 are being represented here and you can see uh, oh, they're similar-ish but they clearly not the same. And then this is the reveals reconstruction from pollen data of uh, land cover. So you can see that according to the pollen data, both the models are significantly underestimating openness at 6,200 to 5,700 BP. If we then go forward in time, we've got the same issue uh, through prehistory. Uh, but then later on, if we look at more recent times, it seems that uh, reveals and, for instance, KK10 uh, reconstruct in quite a big way. Perhaps um, the models are overestimating uh, the land uh, cover in more recent times. So what this shows is that there's considerable disagreement, really, if you compare <laughs> the pollen data with the uh, land use data, which has been, or land cover data, which has been done through the models, uh, that we need to sort of try to address. So this is partially why uh, we started to do the, the European work. Um, I think, I suspect Mark has already shown this. So this is really just summarising the approach that uh, we started to take, which is basically to try and uh, create these uh, global classifications and then to derive that information uh, at particular time slices at a continental scale. Um, so this is the classification again that Marco has shown. And so one of the first things we've done is that we revisited these for the European group uh, because I guess these were uh, developed within a particular group, but we wanted to make sure that they were applicable for Europe. And I think broadly speaking, we were reasonably happy with the level one classifications uh, with one exception. And that is, I think, and this is in conversation with the modelers, it was very much felt it was important to have a land use classification which represented we do not know the answer. So um, rather than having something that says uh, yes we know agriculture is happening here or uh, we suspect agriculture is happening here, the modelers are also keen to see a level of certainty or uncertainty in the data. Uh, and that conversation led us to thinking much more about our levels of certainty of information, both in terms of chronology and in terms of how we classify, how we understand these land uses. Um, we've also revisited some of the categorisation, particularly for hunter-gatherers and agriculturalists. I'm not going to go through these because these are very much still a work in progress, but I think uh, they're not too far off what the main scheme is. 
Um, but my point in drawing this to your attention is that there's still quite a lot of debate to be had about what do we mean. I mean we had a lot of discussion about the design of modern clocks. What do we mean by that? Um, and so making sure that we're all speaking the same language is actually quite a big challenge in this project, um, especially since the definitions are still ongoing. And when we started this work, we didn't have all the definitions at hand. So that's kind of led to quite a, a lot of use or discussion around definitions. Um, moving on from that, we also had a lot of discussion around how we do this because there's no easy way to do something of this sort of magnitude. I guess most archaeologists are used to dealing with site data, maybe regional data, but not at a continental scale. So the task that we had set ourselves um, precipitated a whole range of other issues that we have only really just started to grapple with. Um, the first thing is around chronology because obviously we're being asked to map at a particular time frame and that's 6000 BP and we were asked to go either side of that by 250 uh, years uh, so we have used all sites which encompass the, the 6000 BP date within that range so that does mean that there are some sites which fall within that range but which do not encompass the 6000 BP date which are left out so it is very much a, a, a snapshot, uh, and that's, that's sort of producing some quite interesting results. Um, we've also been thinking a lot about data quality and uncertainty. We have sites which are well dated. We have sites which are much less well dated. We have sites where we have pottery evidence, mm -hmm. where we know they're agriculturalists, but no archaeobotanical data. So how do we deal with that level of uncertainty? When we suspect, we know they're probably agriculture agriculturalists but we don't actually have the evidence how do we record that how do we make clear that those assumptions so we're having to really think quite carefully about the kind of decisions that we're making the other issue that came up in our meeting and I don't think it's resolved is how do we deal with bits of information between data points so we have sites and we have lots of space between sites what do we deal with how do we deal with that information do we assume people are moving in that landscape? Uh, do we put a buffer around it? Uh, do we just use expert knowledge? But all of those things require a decision process. They require transparency. And certainly modelers are really interested in this because understanding that level of certainty and uncertainty allows them to, to run different thresholds with their models, different uncertainties, to really establish where the errors might be. And I, I think we're starting to move in the right direction with the rules of interpolation, but we've still got quite a lot of work to do. Recording of metadata. How do, you, how do you make sure that there is a clear and transparent mechanism by which all your decisions are being made? Uh, and we've been talking quite a bit about this. Um, we've also had a lot of discussion around, in Europe, we have lots and lots of data points. In other parts of the world, there are many less, there may be less data points, but more knowledge around a particular region, and I suppose what you might call more arm waving. So how do you deal with those two levels of information? And I think certainly the Europe group were very much of a strong view that we have to work from the data points. Uh, and this is a slight disjunct between what the overall project wants us to do and how we feel we need to work as archeologists. So I think we reconcile that now. Uh, from some of the work I, I'll show you in a minute, but there's been a lot of discussion around that. Uh, in the end, what we've done is we've used both mapping using radiocarbon dated sites and expert mapping, but the idea is we keep those layers separate so we are able to distinguish between different levels of knowledge and we can maintain a level of transparency so that if anybody queries our decision, we can go back, we can revise our decisions. Um, also, the other issue that came up with the modelers is they want quantified land use. They're just not, they're not actually just interested in there are hunter-gatherers here. They want to know how much land use are these people doing? How much are they taking off the land? What percentage of the land? And we're like, oh, no. uh, But the modelers will say, hey, if you tell me they are hunter-gatherers here, I will put 100% hunter-gatherers and I will assume, or 100% agriculturalists and I will assume 100% agriculture in this cell. Now we know as archaeologists that's rubbish, you can't do that. So we have agreed, somewhat reluctantly, to try and put some values on. But this is really important from a modelling perspective. 
And I think there is this process of reconciliation between what the modelers want and what we are able to provide. And we're talking different language, different expectations. So it's been quite an interesting process, but actually having one of the modelers at our meeting was very helpful. So these are some of the results. And I'm just gonna show you a series of, of images that show you the process. So the initial stage that we under, uh, underwent was we basically used paper maps, which had been printed out. Uh, they were, they had already been sort of developed within a GIS and they were done by hand. So we divided people up into groups and we just over a process of an afternoon because we spent a day and a half talking about the methodology, we started to map out. So we literally just drew our maps. I can see Eric's face, it's just like a picture. Uh, so here we have hunter gatherers, here we have agriculturalists, and then the rest within this are agriculturalists. Um, so and different, it's interesting because different groups approach the exercise slightly differently. So uh, in this group, they just assigned uh, land use category one and then uh, labeled everything up and then put the metadata in a, in a sheet. This group took a, a more sophisticated approach. This group just kind of went, ah, hand together, it's all over the British Isles. We don't need to be sophisticated about this. Uh, so that's the first part. So we came back, we got it scanned in, and this is what we got. Hmm, that's interesting. Uh, we also mapped out uh, different levels of data, and I, I'm not going to dwell on this, but it's, we started to think, okay, do we map at when we know for sure there are people here and they're dated, or do we map, say, for instance, where we've got settlement sites, but we've got no archaeobotany? How do we distinguish between those levels of information? Um, so here, here is the land use map done at level one category. Now you'll notice that there is apparently nobody in this area of the world, that's not true. Um, it's because the Spanish group <laughs> hadn't finished their work and Ferran has now sent me a, a data sheet, but actually for reasons that should become clear, it's not a problem. So this is what it looks like. Um, this transparent blob here is something that was sent to me later on giving sort of uh, more of a, an extensive idea of um, I think early land use. So it's already starting to show different categories. So the, the, the next thing we did was, uh, Mark, and this came up at the meeting, Mark Van Blinden very kindly allowed us to make use of his radiocarbon dates. Um, so these are all radiocarbon dated sites from across Europe. It's not, it's a, it's a very extensive data set, but it's not a complete data set. And it's mapped out here. And it, showed, it shows uh, thermal density estimates as well. So it's starting to show where you might have some groupings of sites. And these are grouped at 250 kilometers. And you'll see that the map looks different. Uh, it also has data points where um, uh, we didn't have previously. And I think having seen this, and I, as I'll show you in a second what the two look like, we became more convinced, increasingly more convinced, that we have to start from the point data. This is really important. Um, so we have rebelled, I'm afraid, against the original um, instructions that we received, but I think we can reconcile them. Um, this is the same information, but starting to filter it out between charcoal and chocolate samples. So most of this data set is all georeferenced. It has quite a lot of associated environmental data with it, but it is going to have to be populated uh, in terms of other more detailed information for land use. And we also need to start to populate for other parts, particularly here, other parts of Europe for which we don't have any data. And we've just agreed that we will try and do that over the next couple of months. When you then superimpose the, the blob map, maps, um, I think what's actually quite interesting is how accurate we were. Um, if you look at the British Isles, oh, it's not bad actually. Um, okay, up in Scotland, perhaps we need to be a bit more sophisticated, but over here, it's, it's not bad. So this is a first pass. And I think our conclusion from all of this is that we have to use the radiocarbon data, but also there are lots of parts of Europe and elsewhere for which there are many less well-dated sites, but which we know there are agriculturalists or hunter-gatherers during the time frame. And we want to make sure that we can include that level of information and essentially show it at different levels of resolution. So the two will be put together. 
Um, the last thing I want to show you is this. So this is just revisiting the hide map at 4,000. So according to this map, I think we should primarily be in the semi-natural woodlands remote. Now, as you can see, there are lots and lots of sites, lots of things happening. I doubt very much that really what we're seeing is remote wood, semi-natural woodlands. So the overlap between the data that we have in terms of radiocarbon dates and the model data, clearly there's a disjunct between it. But also in some areas, I know, I think Mark was talking about some of these areas, people are definitely cultivating, they're having quite a big impact on the landscape. So this tells us very clearly that there are big issues with the hide map. We kind of knew that, but it's quite nice to see that. Um, and, okay, so this is the database which we will eventually hope to make use of. So the idea will be that we will aggregate this information uh, into the grids, the, the eight by eight kilometer grid squares. Uh, but I think once you've made a decision about a land use class and a grid, you can't really go back once you've made a particular decision, which is why we've decided to take the approach that we have, which is essentially to move up from the data points. We will create our own data set of the European data, and then it will be aggregated. And already we have the grid behind the map that we've got anyway, so, so the, 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 map, the European map will, will, can be moved up relatively easily into the grid system. Uh, that's all I'm going to say. Uh, I'll leave it there.